Welcome to the We Are Libertarians bonus show. I am joined by Harry, Reinhold, and Hody. Uh, Hody, how are you doing? Oh, man. So good and glad to be talking to the bonus people, the Patreons, because those are the only people I actually care about. <laughs> now, uh, you know, I don't think we've really filled Harry in, and I don't know what you want to talk about, but I'll kind of let you lead the discussion. But I have to be honest with the listeners, and uh, I think we're in good company, but I think for the last three years, and I've talked to Harry about this a little bit, about t twice a year, I want to shut down the podcast. I'm ready to close it all down. I just get so sick of politics. I get so sick of people. I, I love our people, and I continue to do this because of people like those of you listening and the great letters that we consistently get from people saying I'm a libertarian because you guys brought me to libertarianism. But I've got to be honest, like this whole Bill Weld thing, it just – wore me out uh, I'm worn out with people I'm worn out with politics like I haven't read anything in a couple weeks like it was nice to have last week off uh, just because sometimes you need a little bit of a break like we I recorded that the week before with with Rob but I don't know it's I, I, the the older I get uh, the more wisdom I see in like what Roger Paxton has said is like I'm just trying to make my family free you know, watching Big mm -hmm. Fish for the first time, uh, you see in Big Fish the end where he's taking him to the lake. Yeah. And you see all the people in his life are at the lake. Mm -hmm. And I just watched that and I went, you know, the only world that matters are the hundred people that show up to your funeral. Like the hundred people that you come into contact with on a daily basis, like that's your world. Like there's no reason for a Hoosier to care about what New Yorker Christian Gillibrand thinks about Virginian Governor Ralph Northam. Like there's, there's really no reason for me to care about what's happening in Venezuela. Like because functionally none of it matters to my life. Yeah. But the MAGA hat kids and the Gillette ads of the world, like we, we have this view of the public sphere really matters when really it's just about our small lives and you go like, am I making a difference doing this? Am I really like making a difference uh, even focusing on politics and not, you know, maybe more of my religious activities, like working at, you know, food pantries and things like that. So sometimes I struggle with keeping the show going because I just don't care. <laughs> uh, and it's not that I, I care about the listener, but I just don't care about politics and what we're talking about because I find it meaningless. And really at the core of it is improving myself so I can be a better support system for the people around me. It really matters way more than what I think about Donald Trump. Like getting my health right with diet and exercise mm -hmm. you know going to therapy uh you know participating in in spiritual events no matter what your religion you know i'm a christian and so i i go to christian stuff or uh maybe that's yoga for some people um you know finding personal fulfillment and growth i think hody a lot of times matters way more than a lot of the stuff that we talk about. The, yeah, absolutely. And that's the edification process, I think is something that's necessary for me to keep going in it. I think like you, I have been sick of politics and sick of making things political. Like that MAGA hat kid thing was all about a failure in media and it just became a firestorm of politics. And I just was tired of discussing it no matter of what the MAGA hat means to different people and I I'm tired you know I'm tired of the Bill Weld thing I'm 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 tired of all of it I I know what my perspectives are I enjoy sharing my ideas recording the daily podcast I'm I will admit I am not taking the crown from a Chris Spangle or a Tom Woods anytime soon it's something I do for me I think it's fun it's like a person who plays guitar for fun and they like doing it. I'm like, oh, it's my voice and I'm doing something. Mom, I'm doing something. It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's something I, I do for, for myself. But that's because it's personally constructive to me. And then sometimes it's like, hey, do you want to record more dailies about these politics? Like, man, not really right now. 
Like I am loving the book club so much because I've gotten so much development from it. I joined the Boss Hog uh, Dakota Davis's book club and that was awesome. So I'm reading the two books at once now. Um, and both those have been great because I've been fulfilled and I'm trying to fill my time with more things that fulfill me. Now, one of the things that I did want to say is you talk about the hundred people that you want at your funeral. Sometimes I do feel like I need to send in invitations to that funeral though, which is why I like social media a little bit because it allows me to connect with like a Chris Spangle, a Harry Price, a Reinhold, a Paul Copeland, Sarah Brady Wagner, everybody at the Wall Network because they're people after my own heart that want to change culture, that want to live a life of liberty, that want, that want to build each other up, that believe in positive discourse as opposed to anger mechanics. And I love that I've managed to find that. And By the way, actually, anger mechanics, anger mechanics, my favorite Nick Tunes show. My niece loves it. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good way to get the rage out for those toddlers who are just so angsty. It's called you know? a joke, learn it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but, you know, and so for me, what I'm trying to do right now is I'm kind of reassessing my time. I've reorganized my time at work so that I'm done by five o'clock, you know, mountain time every day. And I just want to do something constructive, something that is positive and building, kind of like the book club. I've got the book club. I've got, I want to stick to recording at least one or two daily, you know, dailies a week for the wall network. But I don't know what the next step is right now. And I've got a lot on my plate and a lot to think about. And I think, you and it's, I have, I think it's, it's balance. You know, I, I think for me, you know, you've probably noticed that we're down to one episode a week and it's, uh, we launched a new mobile app at work. And I had 500 emails to answer last week. And it's just like, I just at some point in January had to say to myself, like, this isn't going to be consistent when you have two things worth to say, say it. But the balance was so out of whack for me for, for the last, for all of 2018 in producing content for this, that the dailies have allowed me to find balance, which I, I love you, Hody and Sarah and Paul and, and, uh, and Reinhold for, and Brian Nichols, uh, when he gets me that audio, uh, for <laughs> providing, <laughs> providing, <laughs> that's a joke for only he and I, yeah. um, you know, cause I don't want we are libertarians to be all of my identity because it can't be. And living alone with no kids, no wife, um, you know, nobody that I'm accountable to, I'm accountable to no one. You know, I feel accountability to the patrons. I feel accountability to my job. I feel accountability to some level of my family. But at the end of the day, I want to come home and do whatever I want to do. I can, and I often find myself doing too much work. Nobody says, you need to stop working on this. You need to go to church or meditate or exercise. Like, there's always something to do. And so it's kind of like, I've got to find that balance sometimes. Well, if you want, I can come over and drop Gunther off for hours at a time. I would totally watch hours. Gunther. I would yeah. totally watch Gunther. <laughs> I, I, w I cannot wait to be a dad. Sweet. I'll just start dropping her off here. Yeah. Just, this, this is your white dad. Yep. yep. Uh, It'll be easier on me. No, I think personal growth, Harry, you've, you've always been a, an inspiration to me in that respect in that you have to have balance. You have to mm -hmm. have a balanced identity. You can't have one thing be all of your identity. Uh, and personal growth is an important part of a successful society, community, and yeah. as libertarians. Yeah, you know, as life, you know. And you could divide your personality up to 12 different internet avatars if you feel like it. The other thing which I'm shocked to, like, I'm actually happy with this whole idea of, like, the 100 people at your funeral and for Big Fish is because that's the whole, you know, that's the breed of anarchism that I'm in. It's like, you know what? I'm going to do my best to live inside the crack or find the cracks inside the system to, so the government doesn't see me. You know, I, I don't know if we'll get anarchy in my lifetime, but I'm going to go find the crack inside the system and live inside that crack. Oh, and that's the problem with government these days is that it's too large and all-encompassing instead of focusing on who who's your mayor, who's your, mm -hmm. you know, township board and, and all that stuff. You don't care. You don't know because you're all worried about who's the president and who's the right. senator because – all the decisions are being made there. Decisions should be close to your community because every community is going to have different wants and needs. Uh, it's not one size fits all in this country. 
Mm-hmm. And that was, yeah, like, there's like a, in the, the town I live in, Lawrence politics, like that town was uproar about like, just because they wanted to move the police station and how much money they were spending on building the new police station. But like, when you like sitting there at the argument, there's like, this is a good argument. This is a reason, there's the perfect reason. Everything was thought out. The only thing I got upset with is that if they just went like a few feet further south, they could just take a building, repurpose it. And I thought it was a huge waste of money. But you know, that's, well, we had a um, situation where I lived where somebody wanted to put in a shooting range mm-hmm. in a very rural area that was farmland, no, and it's like, you know, we moved out here to be for quiet, and you're going to have guns going off seven days a week. Um, so we, you know, there was a discussion about that, and they we found out that they couldn't do it because of the zoning laws. But you know, that's you know, here or there on that, but it, it's. You know, it's the local communities getting together and making decisions about their people who they who care about and know about and, and mm-hmm. spend their time around. Yeah. So how do I get more like closer to your 100 people? Because I think on one end, I just want to say, I don't like the physical restraints. That's one of the things that I'd liked about social media is to say, Not I can am this close a friend to you. Oh. Mm-hmm. You know, how, how do I get, how do, how does a Hody Johns get that invitation to somebody who's out there in Indiana or somebody who's in Indonesia or, or, you know, wherever the Liber- Liberty movement may be, or, or somebody more important than the Liberty movement, somebody that I've developed a real friendship well, with. Well, you, well, is your question, how do you build intimacy with someone on a, at a longer distance? The, I guess the overall question is, I just don't know. I want to take a creative direction right now. I want to do something more with the time that I have. I still want it to be like with the wall network, but also personal to something that I can. And I don't know, I've got so many different ideas right now. I, I am close with charities. I've, I've had experience drafting legislation before. I am close with my Weber County libertarians. We could easily do like a boss hog of libertarian county or of uh, weber county <laughs> libertarian county we all wish um <laughs> you know or i could do a debate format because i've always been passionate about debate i just for me i just don't know what that next step I, is and i want I it to be genuinely great. i genuinely like that debate idea i think that there is i think the um in prepping for this show i have fallen in love with intelligence squared if you don't know yeah. what that podcast or video yep. series is or the monk debates I have really learned a lot in a short amount of time by hearing well-prepped people. Uh, I really like that idea. One idea that I've had for the show is maybe taking one of the four shows a month and dedicating it to a charity. Uh, In times like this where it's kind of lean and there's not a ton of news that I'm interested in or I'm just not interested in looking at the news, you know, interviewing a charity or talking to somebody who, you know, because I work with... Um, I run in circles with a lot of people who serve on nonprofits or whatever. And, you know, they're, they're desperate to tell their story. And I think when you hear the stories that they can provide, it gives you new perspective. Like the cost gives you new perspective about the world that you live in. And I was working on this, uh, I'm working on this podcast about Indiana politics and history and, um, Dealing with, uh, we're talking with the city market. It's a public space here in town. Most cities have a city market that's left over from the olden days. Mm-hmm. They have a lot of homeless people that come in. And, you know, he asked, how do you deal with that? And she said, we give them a lot of services. He says, well, how do you balance out losing customers versus caring for that population? She said, I'm sorry if you feel uncomfortable because humanity is in front of you. And I was <laughs> like, <laughs> and and i feel like that's we have chosen especially this audience which is let's be honest guys we're white collar Mm -hmm. we're we're in the top one percent of the world like even Mm -hmm. if you are poor and you are if you're stone out there you know buying a hundred dollar debit card to reload your patreon every month like you're still in the one percent of the world and i think charities the beautiful thing about women entering the workforce is they've created this entire new nonprofit sector and it it gives you the ability to raise up humanity in front of people's faces make them feel uncomfortable Mm -hmm. um you know i think the domestic violence episode that we did on 141 with amanda it's important for people to hear that this is what's going on 
so you can change it. It's important for you to understand that there are fourth graders in, uh, so if you know Greenwood, Greenwood's really close to here. It's yeah. south of Indianapolis. Yeah. It's upscale part of, I mean, it's not upscale, but it's- has it's, a crappy lounge, yeah. It's middle, middle, middle class. Mm -hmm. Their elementary school, their counselors are dealing with sex trafficking, mm -hmm. child selling, yep. prostitution of elementary school students. This is happening in your community. And it's happening in the places that you don't think it's happening. You think sex slavery, oh, that's happening in the African neighborhoods downtown. Mm -mm. It's happening in your white suburban neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and when you shine the light on that and talk to people who are dealing with the populations you don't want to look at, I think that's, a, that's something I may do. I think there's some, uh, some interest on my part, Hody, and something along those lines. The, I mean, the more charities, the better that we focus on. Because I think private charity is obviously a huge, uh, but I, I love the debate idea and I love the charity idea. I think beyond even just like giving to charity, I, it's just something that I want to do personally. Like, okay, so that we have we have a prison around here, and I just think it would be that you're open to cook for the prisoners if you want. Right. Uh, you just have to provide the food and, and whatnot like that. And just personally, I've been trying to set aside some money for that so that one day, because I love to cook, and I just one day would love to give them like a steak dinner because I've seen what they have to eat and it's garbage and I just want to show them love. And I just want to do, that's what I mean like creative, just something that creates. And maybe I slide in just a little bit, maybe like just a porcupine on the paper plate that they throw away. Just a little bit of liberty to let them know, like, just so you know, like, the guy who cared enough to, like, set aside money to get you guys. I don't, I don't even <laughs> think you need to do that kind of stuff. Like, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm getting ready to start because I've really been thinking about it. I'm like, you know what? I'm tired of living in my bubble of privilege where I am talking to people like me. And, you know, like, Harry and I are in the same socioeconomic bracket. He's a little above me, to be honest, but, uh, <laughs> you know, we're in the same socioeconomic, like everybody I deal with is in, you know, we're doing pretty well that what be it 25 year olds mm -hmm. or, you know, whatever your race, ethnic color, like I'm around people who are in the same bracket. Right. And as a Christian, I feel called to break out of my comfort zone and deal with populations that, uh, I may not feel comfortable around. But also as a libertarian, I think just when you go and get involved in the community and start helping the populations that need help, be it women of domestic violence, homeless, uh, children who are dealing with, uh, you know, I mean, orphans, I, just th the elderly. There's so many needy populations that need hands and feet. And I don't think you need to put a porcupine on the plate. I think that when you engage with a human being on a human level and you would develop a relationship with them, out of that comes, why are you doing this? Wasn't that the always the, uh, the motivation for a lot of Christians going out and helping and, and doing things was that you didn't have to go and say, hey, we're Christians and we're helping you. Right. It was just you were living the life and people would see you living it right. and go, oh, maybe, you know, maybe he's got something I want to look into. And then they would ask questions and that's how you did it. It's the people, it's the, the gospels are full of stories of people who nobody cared for them. The, the man by, by the pool who can't get into the pool because no one will help him and he can't lift himself in. And it's Jesus who comes over and helps him into the pool. It's Jesus who touches the lepers. It's it, you know, the, from a Christian model, um, the circumcision of the penis in the Old Testament, not I'm not getting to, into the circumcision debate, but uh, if you're a Christian, listen up. Uh, the circumcision of the Old Testament was a physical, outward, like this was a sign because you're 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 different than the other, you're different than the Philistines, you're different than the other groups. But the in in Philippians, Paul says you are the circumcision. So the idea that we circumcise babies now as Christians is stupid because there's no biblical, Basis like there's it. no biblical New Testament reason for it. Mm -hmm. You are to be the circumcision. You are to be the outward appearance of something different, something special. Mm -hmm. There's something different about you that you are filled with love that you go and talk to the people. Cause when you do charitable work, nobody says, why the, f 
why are you doing that? Maybe they'll say, are you safe? But for the most part, people go, good for you. That's great. Well, and, and I, I, it was kind of the topic of the daily I did a couple of days ago where, you know, we need to start living the lives of libertarians instead of waiting for government to say it's okay to do it. Mm. And one of those things is helping people. And one, and one of the ways I've always wanted to do it and have, have in the past before uh, when I had more time was doing mentoring. Right. Mentoring programs. I, I calculated if everybody picked one person to mentor, we could eradicate most of the uh, poverty in the, in the, in the ingrained repeated uh, situation these people are in because most of them want out. Most of them mm-hmm. don't want to be there yeah. in that situation. They just don't know how. Right. And no one's teaching them. No one's talking to them. Everybody's can't give them handouts, give them a card that they can use to go buy food, but that doesn't help them. You know, Harry, uh, Harry and I volunteer to mentor the IU volleyball team. Uh, <laughs> they see Petey and in, uh, but to to that point, I worked on a campaign in 2004 with Andy Horning, the great Andy Horning, and uh, he put his campaign headquarters in uh, it was like 21st and and Capital. I mean, it was like the hood, yeah. and he it was in this this old black gentleman's house yeah, and uh, the Reverend, and he was quite a quite a character. He was a former boyfriend of Julia Carson, who Andy was running against. So he had all kinds of crazy stories. But there was a woman named Pat who worked on the staff. She just didn't have much going on. She she didn't have a job. She didn't have a home. She lived at the campaign headquarters because it was a big house. And she answered phones and did clerical work. And then after it ended and this living situation didn't work out, one of the campaign volunteers, Mike, took Pat, this elderly black woman, into his home, got her a job at Church's Chicken, gave her a home for three months, helped her get a job, helped her get herself set up. And then she, you know, I ran into her a few years down the line. She goes, Mike was my angel. He saved, he saved my life. Like he, he, I didn't know what I was going to do. And I'm sure that that was uncomfortable for Mike, a white guy from Speedway to open up his home to someone of a completely different ethnicity, socioeconomic class, culture, to allow them into their home because he saw someone that had value. He saw a human being and he said, this person has value and I have the ability to help them. And that's truly where I think, um, you know, libertarians, we, we like this program likes to engage in the culture wars, but you have to understand, like if you study the civil rights movement, this is where a lot of SJWs go wrong. Like Martin Luther King knew he needed whites. He knew that to change the culture, he needed the privileged. Yep. Uh, we recoil from being called privileged. But the reality is that you, I think about a lot of stuff on a daily basis Harry does not, that Harry has yeah. to think about. And I, and I think that's, because of the, co- because yeah. of the color of his skin. Yeah. I never think about my safety. Like if I'm working and I bend over, I never think about a man checking out my ass. Women, women, their life is constant harassment. Like, and through conversations, I understand, wow, my experience is different than Harry's. My experience is different than a woman's. And it changes my behavior. It, it makes me um, change as uh, a human being because I start to see the different as the same. Um, you know, and so I think that's an important part of what we do on the show is try to bring you conversations between pe- people that don't make sense. Like it doesn't, you know, like, so, but we who are in the privileged category mm-hmm. can reach down and help people who just are desperate for a hand up. You know, if you were in the civil rights era, if you were in slavery, you know, I grew up, I grew up in Plainfield, Indiana, which was where the, all the national, the, the national Quaker meeting house, every, every home in downtown Plainfield has an underground railroad shelter because it was known as an under underground railroad stop. I grew up completely unaware of race. Like mm-hmm. I genuinely like had no, like it, three or four generations later in a town that really cared for black human beings that their children's children's children instilled that into the community. And so when I get into the world, I have no awareness 
that life is different for Harry because of the color of his skin. Now, that's a good thing, but it also means I'm ignorant in certain ways, you know. Um, so I think that, that that's an example of real privilege, that that's where this actually comes from. Like, the, the problem is when you start to use that as a bludgeon mm-hmm. and you start to say, you need to give up your opportunities. It's a scarcity mindset. Right. You need to give up because, the, you know, that's what I like the word privilege. Right. I, I think there's, there's, there's got to be a better way of describing right. that where you aren't being treated less than you, you're being treated like a human being should be. Other people are not getting treated as well as they should be. Right. Let's focus on that instead of saying that you have been ri- lifted up above your station. And that's kind of what the word privilege I think it's, institutes. I think it's like having dealt with women involved in domestic violence. Men who beat women or men who are predators are, are boys. They're tiny children. They're mental midgets. They are scared of everything. Yep. They are absolute squishes. They're overcompensating. They're too. overcompensating. They are terrified of everything. Mm-hmm but they don't respect women. And so they don't fear women and they don't listen to women. And so when their women stand up to them, they see a lesser than in a domestic violence situation. Mm -hmm. But if you're a man in someone's life, or if you're a man in a woman's life going through that and you stand up to the man, he folds like a chair because he's a pussy. (laughs) Like, (laughs) because, and you don't realize that you have that power. You have the power as a person of power. Every single person listening to me right now is a powerful person. And you have some power where you can take the power that you have and adjust the power for somebody else who is lacking it. You know, and I think that uh, talking about politics, we're trying to look at political solutions when really like when you're talking about changing power dynamics we focus so much on trying to change the power dynamic between us and the government that we forget about the other power dynamics in our lives where we can, where we can probably make a bigger direct impact. Right. You know, Well, when I always look at politics as I'm trying to keep the government from hurting my family, hurting my friends, right. Putting them in situations that are untenable and they have to fight against. Right. You know, is if you, uh, if you think something should be done, if you think your neighbor should do something, if you don't have the belief in that enough to go and make it happen yourself, then why are you voting for other people to do it for you? So right. you can absolve yourself from that conflict. You so, talked about in the daily, the the forgotten man, Reinhold, that, right. you know, basically what you're saying is if I am unwilling to give, I'm asking the government to force someone get to give with a gun. Mm -hmm. And if they don't, then they should shoot them. And so if you need to be willing to get to the point, if you think the government should do it, you should be willing to go to your neighbor with a gun yourself and take the money from them to give it. And I thought that was a very astute point because that really got me thinking about this whole charity thing and how we give. We have an order of operations problem largely within the party. We say, well, once the government decreases enough, I'll finally be able to have the money and the time in order to give it to you. And people just aren't going to trust us that way. Maybe you will be able to give more, but you need to give some right now. You need to be able to give what you have now. Compromise. Yeah. And, and proving to, to other people, hey, this right. will work. We, we can prove it now. We don't have to try and convince them with the words. We can, in action, show it working. No one believes words anymore. Look at social media. Words are cheap. Well, the hundreds of actions that this audience yeah. can participate in on a daily basis, mm-hmm. that has weight. You have, when you're talking about politics, you have one action that you can take that sends a signal and it's a vote. But you have hundreds of daily choices that make up the, the society that you live in. And you can use those to make people more free or less free. And the other thing I've noticed too is a lot of libertarians are very... Um, anti-emotion mm-hmm. right and they're like well you know don't think with your emotions don't believe with your emotions and, and that's just an emotional response Not and true. blah 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 and i'm like emotions are just a a, a signal to your brain just there like you okay if you if you uh were to prick your finger you would feel that because you're getting a sense sensory perception from that through your nerves up to your brain and it's telling you oh i just had that happen mm-hmm. all an emotion is is you getting information 
from the, the societal reactions around you and people's interactions with that. So you're feeling them. It's empathy for what they're feeling. And those are just um, more information that's being given to you. How you react to that is something that you can control. And you can say, okay, I choose to accept this as rational, emotional, as opposed to irrational, emotional, and temper yourself. But if you completely ignore it, if you completely shut it out, you're, you're basically numbing your body. Um, and then when you walk around with a numb body and you cut yourself, you're not going to know it and you're going to have it get sepsis and fall off. It's the same thing. If you ignore your, your emotions and sensing the world around you, you're going to atrophy that part of your life and then you're going to become less human being for it. Right? Yeah. I think empathy is the lifeblood of a libertarian society. Yeah. And mm -hmm. You have to understand, like, in, in a decentralized market, that is what solves problems. Let me make this point, and then I'll throw it to you, Harry, because I know you got something to say. Um, the, the answer to so many problems is the market will take care of it. But what is the next step beyond that? It's, it's a lot of times it's empathy or a problem being solved or, you know, the, the nonprofit world will take care of it. And... When you, when you take something, I was talking, I was having this, I have this conversation like every day. Um, let me pull this up. Um, you know, we, well, basically this person is getting, this person's, uh, well, I can't go into it. Uh, I wanted to, but I was like, eh, I, I can't. Um, I answer the question every day, well, how will we help this class or how will we help this group that doesn't have power, that doesn't have of the availability of resources that doesn't have this or that. And the answer is empathy. I'm not going to lie. I don't care about pet shelters. Like I am so uh, human focused and so obsessed with human beings and their needs that I look at pet shelters and I go, this is a tremendous waste of resources. These, this is property. Uh, my, I love my cats dearly, but they are property. They're animals. They don't have the divine spirit that humans do we will give thousands of dollars a year to animal shelters, but we won't feed the homeless. Like it doesn't make any sense to me, but at the end of the day, if that's what a person listening is into and that's what motivates you and that's what you care about and that's what you're moved by and that's what draws empathy, I'm glad you exist to take care of animals because yeah, I'm sure shit not going to do it because I don't give a fuck. Like I want to go to Harry because yeah. Harry, Harry's waiting patiently. You just, you just described my wife and right. how I'm not going to let her listen to this episode now. <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> <said that. laughs> and the puppers are so cute. People, they need help. People can look at me like I'm a monster, but at the end of the day, like I think I'm making my point right. very clearly. Like I'm not going to participate in raising money for animal shelters. I just don't think it's an efficient use of resources. But if you don't agree with me, that's cool. Because I'm not going to force my belief right. on you. That's the great thing about doing and this. You're not going to make you me believe. right. You're not going to make me participate in your life. Yeah, yeah. Um, one thing is you, you guys are talking about like giving and showing that you can give. Uh, baby step number seven in the Dave Ramsey system, and that's why people believe in Dave Ramsey's uh, whole like financial peace university. And it hasn't really changed that much because it's just living the lifestyle, going to the baby steps, and doing it, and showing so many people do it in the community and watching that many people get out of the slavery which is debt is the exact same thing and so and baby sits seven is always like and then give back help other people you know it's that tenement that you know inside of a in, in financial piece you know you feel so great when you get there because you know you are helping people yeah yeah like libertarianism is not just a set of beliefs and libertarianism is not a religion and it's not an identity Religion, uh, like libertarianism is a practice. It's every day comparing yourself to this constant set of nonviolence mm -hmm. principles and how can you enact nonviolent principles and caring for your fellow man together. You know, so uh, final thoughts. Let's, let's start wrapping up. Hody, final, uh, let's end with Hody and okay. then let's start with Harry and then we'll go around the table here. All right. Um, being someone of the privileged class, I like to have someone around me to help me keep me grounded to the um, others. Um, I use my uh, wife. She likes to work with those people. Uh, <laughs> Some may say she's 
related to those people. Related to them, <laughs> them people. Uh, <laughs> and by them, you mean the poors. Yeah, the poors. <laughs> well, no, she, you know, she's first one person like that in my life that can like stand about being around the general public. Mm -hmm. You know, like I'm fine. I could be around people. I, you know, I could do it, but I choose not to because some of the things they do frustrate me to no end and i can't hear their daily life struggles other than looking them in the face and go like well you're the problem you're your own problem right. and until you realize that there's nothing i can do to help you right you know the moment you realize you are your own problem then i can help you and show you the show you the door but till then i can't help you mm -hmm. well she helps ground me into those people she helps me like you know understand and be with them i feel so bad at coming to them people but uh she also helps she is a lot more uh, streetwise than I am. And uh, she shows me things that go in. Like when you were talking about. She's white, by the way. Yes. Yeah. Harry's but, wife is more streetwise than Harry. Yeah. She's whitest of the white. Um, <laughs> but she's the one that, like, because, like, when you were talking about how the sex traffic and like that, that didn't shock me at all because, you know, like, she pointed it out to me. Yeah. She shows me it, you know. She was like, this, you know, this, this is who I caught today on camera and stuff like that. And then dealing with the struggle that some of these people are dealing with because the place where she works at now currently, like she sees all these people stuck in these traps. You know? Yeah. And, it's, and in our traps. I mean, that's, that's where I, and I, I can go now is, is the mentoring I was talking about, getting people out of that, mm -hmm. the traps my, that they find my, themselves in. We, we want to help my, them financially. Right. My friend, Miss Pat. She's a comedian, mm -hmm. hilarious comedian. If you don't know Miss Pat, check her out. She's going to be super famous because she's one of the funniest human beings alive. We were having a conversation recently, and she's got some amazing opportunities for ABC sitcoms. And, like, she's just on a level where she's, a, she's like, going to be an overnight sensation in, like, five years, you know, because mm -hmm. she's just worked so hard. And, we, you know, and I'm, you know, don't tell her I said this, but, uh, you know, I think there, when you're, when you're in her position – you kind of look at it and you go, how do I belong there? How do I belong with like in Hollywood? Yeah, how can I fit in there? Like there's no way, like that's such a level that I couldn't imagine getting to. And I'm just like, do you realize that the jump, she lives in my hometown of Plainfield that I talked about earlier. I go, do you realize that the jump, her book rabbit is amazing. It's maybe the best biography I've ever read. Uh, I go, I read your life story. And growing up in the slums of Atlanta, like what you went through, the statistical likelihood of you going from where you lived in Atlanta to Plainfield where I lived is so much more astronomically insane than mm -hmm. from you getting to Plainfield to Hollywood. Right. That's a few well-connected people to getting you to where you need to be in some God-given talent. Mm -hmm. But the struggle to get to, I go, congratulations, you have white privilege now. And she laughed because uh, <laughs> she... You know, she's just, she's an amazing success story already, you know, and no matter if you never hear of her again or not, like, it, there are, I guess it just punched me in the face when I listened to Glenn Beck at Christmas pay off all those Walmart tabs. Mm -hmm. You know, he's in a, in a wealthy suburb of Dallas, he's in a Walmart, and there are people who can't afford to pay $75 on layaway. They just can't get 32 more dollars to pay off layaway because they're struggling that deeply and they're surrounded by people with lots of money and resources. And I don't think that you should ever be forced like AOC wants to, I don't think you should be forced to give that up. I think you should be, I think that you should be, um, I don't want to say compelled because I don't know if that means force or not, but like you should be persuaded to help people if you have the ability. Right. And it's like, uh, what I was saying is that, the the way it is now is that you're demanded to help others before you can help yourself. Yeah, and it should be you should you should make sure you are taken care of, and your needs are met, and your family's needs are met because that's what everybody's real goal is to take care of their family and their immediate friends and stuff, and then help other people. Right. right. You know, as an old uh, Taoist tenet that uh, you know you become immortal by doing a thousand good deeds, but a good deed consists of something that doesn't hurt anybody, including yourself. Right. So that's the challenge is getting there is, is helping other people, but not doing it at your expense to the point that you are detrimentally harming you. There's a great the process. Uh, there's a book called boundaries mm -hmm. and it's Christian based, but it's a really great book on boundaries. And they talk about the good Samaritan. 
it's like the good Samaritan stopped and helped the man get help. You know, he was a Jew and Samaritans didn't talk to Samaritans, like Jews and Samaritans didn't talk, Mm -hmm. but you know, he, he helped the Samaritan because the Samaritan's a human being. It didn't matter that their class difference or their religious difference or whatever. He was a human being in need, but the boundaries goes, but he didn't delay his business trip to Jerusalem to stay for three extra days to make sure that he got all this extra help. He didn't impede on his business. He helped the person. Then he moved on. He didn't. And that was so like life changing for me because being such a codependent person, Mm -hmm. uh, especially after the divorce, it's like, I'm hurting myself to help other people instead of like the best thing you can do is put on your own mask before you help somebody put on theirs. And I think that's kind of where I'm at. So there's there's also people with hero complexes. Yeah. Oh yeah. I was total white, total white knight. Like, I needed to find my meaning in helping other people right? instead of Saving finding people. my meaning in friendships and multiple, a, a very multi-varied pieces of my identity. So Hody, final thoughts. Sure. So I think everybody has somebody in their life that needs help. You mentioned a school close by where they're going through child prostitution and you think it's so far away. And if it seems so far away, you don't have to look far. You don't have to lift too many rocks to find the worms. Um, We had Jamie um, had somebody she worked with that got kicked out of her house. We didn't ask for what reason, but we have an extra room at our house and let her stay there for a little bit. And she is as libtard as libtards get. And she... (laughs) She drives us crazy with the political views, but whenever I talk now, she listens and it's growing on her. Now, it's not all about making her libertarian. That's not the point. You know, the point was we took her out. The thing is, is what she got kicked out for, I think, was dropping acid, doing drugs in the house. The thing is, is she has one side of the family where she took drugs and got kicked out. And then she has somebody else in her life where she still took drugs and got brought in. Which one then do you think commands? more respect in her life now. And there is somebody like that in your life where I'm not saying that you have to agree with them, but you can turn them into an ally. I'm going to expound on the point that you said, Chris, about Martin Luther King Jr. He knew he didn't just need whites. He needed racist whites to change America. He needed people to say, okay, I don't like Black people, I don't, you know, I don't really, I don't choose to sit next to them. I wouldn't choose to hire them. But when I see them cry because a German shepherd has been sicked on their dogs and is tearing on their flesh, there's something about those tears that I just can't resist anymore. And that was the tool. That was the tactic to say, look, I don't need you to accept us all at once, but can you take just a little bit? And that's really the genuine charity that spirit that we need to say, look, I'm going to reach out to them. I might not love where this person, <laughs> I, I, we don't do drugs at our house. I'm not big on acid, right? But she needs somebody to show her love. And when I say, I don't believe that doing acid is good for your life, I am more likely to change her than her own mother who says doing acid is not good for her life. It's not the message it was the method by which we went about showing that we still loved her. Now I understand some drug addicts start stealing from your house. And I mean, there, there's a point where you have to cut things off. Boundaries is a great book. You should absolutely read it. I understand. But you know, that's just the experience that we have. And that's how you really create something. I guess part two of my final thought is, you know, I, I, I think I'll, I, I will do the debate show. The hardware is not where I want it. The software is not where I want it. I tried to get a nice intro. I, I've, tried all these different texts and I'm just not good at it. But if the quality of the conversation is really what's going to sell it, I think I'm just going to dive into it. Zoom is good enough, Hody. <clears throat> yeah. If Zoom's good enough, you know, I, I know how to use that at the very least. And this is something Chris you know, pointed out a long time ago in the, on the Chris Pringle show is that your, your first efforts are not good. You're not going to be happy with them, but you got to do it. Yeah. And that's how you learn what, what, okay, I, this is what I did wrong. This is what I did wrong. You hear it, you learn it. You grow from it. And that's the only way anybody does. Nobody wakes up and it's immediately. The, the only, th- the only way to get good at something is reps. Right. The only way to, like, if you sit there and try to think your way, think about it like your physical life. Try to think yourself into biceps. Mm-hmm. It's not how it works. You have to do reps. 
Like yeah. you, you don't, you don't perfect your brain and it, like, and that's, it's the same with any creative work. So I would just start with zoom. You got zoom. It works. We yeah. can, you know, maybe work out a system of shipping out some of these ATR 2100. So it sounds good. Like, uh, you know, that's why like Leo sends in the mail uh, box with the mic and then they can, there's a tag in there so they can ship it back. You know, maybe something along those lines if they don't have a good mic, but yeah, you just got to start it. You just got to do it. So can go ahead finish up at Hody. No, it, it's all good. So I think I'll start that. And then I think what we said about the charity, maybe once a month do something. I still want to make it wall related. Even if I don't preach, we are libertarians, at least do some recording or something. Talk about people's experience. Cause I still want to, I still want to do it myself and I still want to be for myself. I believe, I truly believe in the good work that you it does as much good for you to give. I know when I went through my divorce, that was my medicine, was volunteering. I went to a veteran's home and all they want is for someone to talk to them. Yeah. That was my job. They didn't, they didn't have any food they needed me to handle. They had all those logistics covered. They're just like these people, there's 20 of them and we don't have enough people to listen to them. And I felt exactly that same way when I was going through it. And it was just such a healing process for me to be able to give. And I just know, I want that feeling again, to be able to give regularly and show that, that this is a good way of life. It's a liberty loving way of life. I guess I just, maybe I'm trying to force the network into it somehow, but I just, it is something that I think that libertarians need to see. And I especially want people to see on our network because it is the ground floor and not those high intellectual, you know, all we do is talk to you and talk at you all the time. But that, yeah, that's all I got. So you, it's like, I want to get Jeffrey Miller on who's fairly libertarian. He wrote, he co-wrote the book mate with Tucker max and it's basically about dating and there's a great podcast called mating grounds. Like if you're bad with men or women, like that's a great show to listen to. Um, and my goal on going out on dates after the divorce was to get that person to like me. Like I had a goal and basically what the thing taught me was don't have a goal. Just show up and try to connect to another human being and have fun. Like your goal is not to get sex. Your goal is not to get a relationship. Your goal is not to get anything other than a nice connection with another human being, you know? And, and I think that, that libertarians a lot of times have a goal. Like I'm trying to convert you. I'm trying to do this. If you want to sell anybody on anything, just talk to them like they're a person. Really actually listen to them. Look them in the eye. Talk to them like they're a person that you have no other goal other than just trying to be their friend. And eventually, like, they'll start asking you questions. Like, you're, if, if your goal is to constantly preach, it's not how it works. Like, if you're trying, trying to teach to people who are not ready to be taught to or preach to people who are not ready to listen, like, then there's no, there's no value in it. You have to build a relationship with somebody first. And you can do that in a matter of moments at an outreach booth. You know, start by asking questions. That's, that's the best way. Like the number one way is get people talking about themselves. Like if you get people talking about themselves, people love to talk about themselves. They, I talk, I talk to so many people on a daily basis. Like I'm, I'm the count. I should, I would be a billionaire if I charged for counseling and, and I love it because I love talking to people about their problems and encouraging them. But like very few people ever ask me, so how was your day? <laughs> Very few people ask me, so what are you struggling with? You know, and when people ask me, like, how are you? I go, oh, good. You know, I don't ever go, well, I'm really, you know. And when I have done that in the past, people are really willing to listen, you know. And if you're the person in somebody's life that is asking everybody, like, so what's going on with you? Like, really, how's your day? Like, what are you doing? Like, people just don't, they just don't have the opportunity to connect with another person because everything is just so quick and so fast and so fake that if you're an authentic, vulnerable person with another person, they'll connect with you. And as you converse with that person, it, 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 it they, and you start to learn about each other's values, then you start working on each other's ideas. Like I cannot walk up to Reinhold at an outreach booth or in a restaurant, sit down and change 
Reinhold's worldview in an in five minutes or two hours or a year. Like it takes people years to move on from things, let go of things, attach to things, detach from things, detach from people, change their views on certain issues. Like think about your own life and how long it's taken you on things like gay marriage or racism or abortion or immigration or and like you feel like you have a better handle on those issues but you still don't like you still know you have so much to learn about those things and then we never extend that to the people that we're talking we just get frustrated at them because they're not listening well that's a controlling behavior and that's not how you persuade someone to your side so uh connection is the number one thing like if you go out on a date with somebody your goal is to make them laugh and learn about them Trust me, you'll get laid like 50% of the time. <laughs> like it's because people are just, I mean, if that, like, I think a lot of young guys, like that's their goal is just to get laid. And so they, they're like trying these moves and I'll neg you and I'll treat you like a mushroom, keep you in the dark and shovel shit. Like it's the most manipulative bullshit and women see right through that kind of stuff, you know? And I think the same thing applies when we go out and try and like, I'm going to convert you to libertarianism. It's like, they see through that. They, they don't want to be manipulated into believing what you believe. They want to understand why you believe what they believe so they can learn something. And that's a vastly, that's a huge difference. Well, there was a, a recent um, Liberty Convention. I don't know if it was Liberty Con, mm -hmm. but it was uh, one of those recently. And the speaker got up and says, how many people have read Dale Carnegie's How to Win yeah. Friends and Influence People? And one person raised their hand. Right. And it's like, there's a problem. If you haven't read that book, it's a great book. Yeah. All right, guys. Thanks so much for joining me, Hody. Uh, you know, we've been here for four hours and I thank you guys for your time and thank you to everybody that listens and hopefully you got a lot out of it. Uh, if you did, please send a note to uh, Reinhold and, you know, Dennis on Facebook. Uh, I'll out you. Harry. <gasps> Harry's on Discord. <laughs> uh, Hody. So <laughs> thanks, guys. We appreciate you and we will see you next week. Download Paladins. And waifus. <laughs> All right, Hody, thank you.